all while living, surviving, and thriving with sickle cell anemia. Now, we've just touched a little bit about Chris and his successes, but we'll get to dive more into that as we uh, go later on in our discussion tonight. So, uh, before we get there, I'm just going to... Conversation series here. It's about a world of thriving with a disability. Right. We're most appreciative of our friends with family network on disabilities, the live streaming, as well as the FSU Flow for assisting with their own uh, version of technology. So, Chris, and you're full of achievements, yes, sir. full of experiences. Can you briefly? Give us an overview into some of the most powerful elements of that story. Yes, sir. So first, I just want to thank you uh, for helping me get here. Uh, I want to thank everybody at the University of Choice for uh, selecting me to be uh, part of the speaker series uh, this year. So thank you for that. Also, I want to thank um, you know my my wife, uh, my best friend, for coming out um, and supporting me, um, and not only supporting me today, but throughout the last couple of years that I've dealt with sickle cell. Um, I think the, the main uh, thing that I've dealt with um, as we talk about achievements is really just making sure that I stay as healthy as possible. But with that, I think that has created the drive in me to achieve uh, any of the goals that I set for myself. So I'll say that's been the, it's, it's very simple. Uh, <laughs> But then it's not. Not. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're yeah. Not taking care of yourself. Wellness. Yeah. yeah. I think health is health is the first priority. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to set any goals for yourself, you have to make sure that you're you're good when you wake up in the morning. Right. Amen to that. Many of us with disabilities, hidden or obvious, have been underestimated or discouraged from setting high expectations. Where's that drive for you to excel come from? I think the drive for me is really just not wanting to be, um, I would say forgotten about. I, I really want my story to be told, you know? Be relevant. Be relevant, yeah. And so that's the thing is making sure that I do enough so the people who come up behind me can say, hey, I have the courage to do this, I have the courage to do that because I know if Chris could do it, then I could pull it off as well. Right, making that door a little yeah, bit open wider. Door. Yep. Right, and, you know, and that's that why, I guess. And yeah. Maybe you jumped way ahead of my question. <laughs> the why. <laughs> right. uh, that, that's important. Sneaking back to your role as a, an award-winning producer. Yes, sir. How and when did you become a storyteller and what's the power in being the producer versus say being the reporter yeah so i think the power in being the producer versus the reporter is you you're able to tell the story yourself and so you're able to say hey you know you get a first shot at what the story looks like you get the facts and you say all right these are the facts but let me make sure that i do my research on it and you add that um, extra information so that people understand why the story is important. Right. Yeah, we live in a social media image world. Mm -hmm. So how do you see you know, TV competing with, say, social media mm -hmm. or the old-fashioned print media? Because mm -hmm. when I grew up, right, you always had to read the newspaper. Yeah. And now it really costs too much to yeah. want to read the five pages but you still need to yeah yeah so i think that's important uh, it's really just about making sure the information is there you know uh whether it's social media or if it's uh tv news you have to find your outlet that you know will give you the right information that you're looking for what kinds of tips maybe mm -hmm. you could give the audience in working with the media yeah. and contacting 
a producer yeah. to get them behind your game or story? Yeah, I think the most important part is figuring out what that news station is, um, what they're good at. Because every news station or every media company has their own niche. Once you figure out what their niche is, you can say, hey, all right, I know this is a business story. I know this is a health related story. You know, they have, a, they may have a health reporter. You contact that reporter and you say, hey, um, I need you to look at this story. I think this is beneficial for you all, not just for me wanting to get the story out there. Once they figure out that it's, you know, it could be a story that um, limits itself to a, a wide range of people, then they'll say, hey, it's, you know, we green like this story. Right. So kind of understanding the beat yeah, of the different beat, yeah. reporters. Mm -hmm. right. And how do people find those beats where, where, when they're looking? You know, what, what are the cues? So you can find them uh, just by going simply online and looking at their email, uh, looking at their bio. Uh, a lot of the news industry is changing now. So a lot of the reporters or even the producers, they'll put their stories on you know, Instagram or Twitter. So you'll get a good uh, gauge of what type of story they tell just from looking at their social media. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. Let me kind of flip the script a little bit because we are celebrating disability, yes, sir. employment, and so forth. And, and to be honest, when we were researching you and reaching mm -hmm. out, I didn't know much about circle size. Yes, sir. Can you engage the audience a little bit? Yeah. What's this mean? Is it uh, genetic? Is it, you know, I, I mean, did mom get bumped in the hallway while yeah. she was pregnant? <laughs> so sickle cell basically comes from, uh, it's, a, it's a blood blood disorder. And so both of my parents have sickle cell trait. And so it's weird. I always say that I was given this disease for a, for a reason because I have a younger sister but she also has sickle cell trait. And so with that, I have the full-blown disease and she only has the trait. And how it affects me is when there, I can't overexert myself. Um, I can't do anything that puts myself um, at a risk of being overexposed to certain things. Like if it's too hot outside or if it's too cold outside, my um, body will start to cramp up. And once it cramps up, that's a, a reason for me, yeah, it's a sign for me to go to the hospital. The hospital. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. So it's, it's simple things. Like I remember one time we were, uh, my wife and I were in the, um, in the in the pool, and just because I didn't dry off well enough, um, I started cramping up. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I I get some of that as a fellow person with a disability. Yes, sir elements and things like that affect me and that's why I moved from Ohio yeah. south to you know, maybe yeah. some better weather. Yeah. But you talked about hospital issues. Mm -hmm. Have you encountered challenges with treatment or therapy mm -hmm. during uh, an incident? And, yeah. and what tools or tricks did you do to overcome that? So um, last year we encountered probably one of the first times um, an incident where it was kind of like we were um, criticized for uh, basically not uh, being, I would say, uh, of influence. Uh, because we were going to the hospital, it was late at night, and I think just because we're, sickle cell only affects uh, black people and Hispanic people. Um, you have some <coughs> Caucasians that are impacted by it, but predominantly it's, um, it's for African Americans. And so with that, you sometimes are um, looked at as a lot of people say, you know, you're not really sick. Right, some unconscious or something. Yeah, yeah, so bias. yeah, biases is, is a great word. So you're not really sick, you're only looking for, um, you're trying to get drugs, you know, to feel better, things of that nature. And so for that, we had to wait maybe, uh, I'll say probably four hours, you know, and I'm at a 10 out of 10 pain-wise and it's just, it's not looking good. And so we went to three hospitals. Uh, we eventually uh, found care at the third one. And then, yeah, it's, it's really, you know, depends on how that person is feeling to that day right. um, for how, how quick you are, are able to be seen. Right. And being able to 
communicate in advance yeah. Yeah. Right, to the healthcare professionals yeah. and stuff. You said something about maybe um, during a conversation last night at dinner about having notes in your phone yeah. um, because you may have difficulty. Yeah. So, yeah, so we, um, we found out that sometimes you can, uh, this last visit to the hospital, um, instead of me trying to tell people how I felt at the emergency room, I just basically wrote a note so I could say, hey, like, this is how I'm feeling, this is why I'm here, you know, um, I can't really talk right now because I'm short of breath and I've been to this hospital before and so those are the type of things that you have to think ahead before you even right. think about being seen by a doctor. Right, I, I get it 100%. I mean, most people would think hospitals are uniquely yep. qualified yep. to be inclusive, <laughs> yep. but sometimes they're, not, they're, they're the biggest barrier. Yeah, they are. Right. Yeah. Right. So it, it, it hurts because you think, oh, you know, they, they should know that me having sickle cell is a big issue, but some people just don't care. I, or it's, perhaps that's a hard word. Maybe mm -hmm. it's uninformed, uninformed yeah. not exposed, yeah. or lacking of education. Yeah, yeah, right. because sickle cell isn't one of those things that is taught a lot in you know in the in the medical field right. when they're coming out of school. Right, there's so much coming out of them. Yeah, it's it's a piece. Yeah, and not a a giant. Piece. Yes, yeah, correct. Right. UOC is about relationships, mm -hmm. community, individuals, and returning back to the community. What are some of the roles? I know you've got some neat partnerships out there. Mm -hmm. Explain who you work with and why. Yeah, so I've uh, recently worked with the Red Cross, um, American Red Cross. Um, I've been able to work with them and help them get more uh, blood donations because when you look at sickle cell with it being a blood disorder, um, you have a lack of people who donate blood. And so recently we were able to, you know, uh, start a campaign, uh, get people to give blood so that that can help sickle cell patients out. In, um, and is there a certain type of blood type that only sickle cell can receive? Nice. Or you open up? A, B, C, O. Yeah, it, it, it varies on what your blood type is. Right. So, you know, you're, you're pretty much open, open okay. to whatever blood you can get. And, and why the Red Cross? Why, what's that connection? Yeah, I think the Red Cross, I, I like what they stood for, uh, what they stand for now. Um, and they seemed very genuine when they came to me and said, hey, this is why we want to partner with you. And so it, it came off of a, a relationship that uh, I was reaching out to a lot of people when I um, published my book, and once they saw that I published the book, they were like, hey, you know, let's partner together, let's do this campaign, um, and we, the campaign went really well, so well that uh, it was announced today we, that we won an award for the video that we uh, published uh, last year. Last, I think it was last year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us about that book, right? Yeah. And, and what was that process like? I mean, <laughs> we got college students here who are yeah. writing papers and stuff, and the paper isn't quite a book. Yeah, yeah. So the process, I would say, probably took the took probably about a I would say it took about a month to write and to really get down and edit it, and then I would say the process of getting it to the publisher. Um, and publishing a book that probably took about I would six say at least months. six yeah at yeah. least six months yeah because you have to do do a couple of rewrites. Uh, my wife was on me and she's like, hey, you know, you missed out this part or you could have told this part better, you know. Uh -huh. So that's my uh, my editor at large. Right, right. right. <laughs> so so yeah, so that's important. You yeah, present her too. Yeah, you're right, you're right. So yeah, so we uh, it took about six months I would say, and then you know, like I said, the rewrites. You want to make sure everything is perfect, so I would say it was it was a, a long process, but uh, also a rewarding part process. Well, well, thank you for bringing um, a few of them. What's the yes, name sir. of the book? Succeeding with sickle cell. Right, succeeding with sickle cell. Yes, sir. Right, and we have some for some yes, sir. Yeah, that's, good. Good. that's fantastic, and that's a great segue into family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, what role did they play in your evolution? You're coming to terms yeah. and 
how, how was I there? I would say mm -hmm. really helping me continue my fight. Uh, they made sure, you know, um, when I was in college, uh, my, my best friend, he made sure, you know, that I was always acclimated for whether it's more water that I may need, whether it's, you know, making sure I'm stretching, making sure I'm working out. Um, so those were the type of things that he took upon himself to do um, when I was when I was in college and just making sure that I'm, I'm good overall. Um, my wife today, she made sure um, that I get enough sleep. She made sure that I am on time for my doctor appointments, things of that nature that make sure that well, sometimes us boys mess up. Yeah, yeah, no, we do a lot. Right? So, so yeah, so she's uh, she makes sure a lot is done. Um, just so the overall picture of me looking healthy is done each and every day. So, you know, this, that's a really interesting side mm -hmm. I'm going on 18 years of marriage, and you know, my wife shares part of my disability journey, mm -hmm. a great deal of it. So talk a little bit more about that and that relationship, I think. Yeah, so um, when we were first dating, um, we pretty much, I, I let her know, you know, hey, I have sickle cell, this is kind of how it works. And um, I think as time went on, she learned more about the, the disease. And uh, we had my first, I'll say probably two years into our relationship is when I had my first uh, scare. We were on vacation uh, at the beach. And right, that was the one place you don't Yeah, I don't want to have one. Yeah, right. so, so we were on vacation at the beach and I had a, a scare and um, I could tell it, it bothered her. Um, and so we, we got through that. Um, we made sure that, you know, we, we knew early on that we were gonna uh, be together. And so we went to go get her tested for sickle cell. Um, just to make sure that she was good because if me having a sickle cell, um, if she has it as well, then our kid would have it. Right, guaranteed. Guaranteed. But right. since she doesn't have it, the kid may just have um, the trait, which is <coughs> like your sister. Yeah, like my sister. So which nothing, she doesn't have any problems or anything like that. So early on, we, we had those talks like, hey, this is how severe it can get. And we saw that come to fruition. Uh, when I had my the biggest crisis of my life uh, last year, and so she she was great through that. She supported me. She made sure that uh, my family knew what was going on. My friends knew what was going on, and uh, we got through it. So that's that's part of the journey that she shares with me. Right. Well, that's fantastic. Let's give it up for the long time. Yeah. I know mine deserves the gold medal. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And she she's very strong about. Yeah. No, I'm not doing something without you. Yeah. We're going to figure this out. Together, yeah. Right. Um, part of our success and part of our opportunities is, is the Americans with Disabilities Act and mm -hmm. Section 504 with programmatic access and stuff. Mm -hmm. Were there any unique challenges in college and, you know, self-disclosing yeah. to your friends? Yeah, what, so what does that look like? Yeah, I think um, I so I, I had the honor of uh, pledging um, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated in college, um, and they, um, you know, it's, it's a fraternity, so you know what could come with that. So, <laughs> uh, so we we made sure, like, hey, you know, I have this disease. This is what can happen. This is what can happen. And um, I think we did a great job of making sure that, you know, I wasn't, uh, I was well, well fed. I was always getting my meals on time. I was, you know, drinking enough water because we uh, do a lot of dancing. And so uh, with the dancing, you know, you have to stretch and you have to do things of that nature. So um, they made sure that I was, I was good. And so that self-disclosure um, helped me and it helped them out. Right. Well, we're in the lights. Do you need a set now? I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can get a set. I can right. get a set. Well, <laughs> well, that gives us a, a moment to say for those who are recently joining us or following us online, we are again with Chris Ruffin, Emmy Award winning news producer, author, advocate, volunteer, and family man. Some of the students here tonight might complain about their assignments. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> uh, about working in groups, you know, versus uh, independent work. Right. What what kind of thoughts might you uh, ideas uh, give them about uh, the workplace? I would say just think about where you want to be. Uh, that's the biggest thing for me. Um, and to this day, I kind of keep that that same mindset. You know, think about what the end goal is. And once you figure out what the end goal is, you can say, all right, I know that turning in this paper or going to this class at 8 o'clock in the morning is worth it because 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I'll be well compensated for the work that I put in today. Mm -hmm. What kinds of techniques or competitive edge did you bring to the classroom and did the disability itself mm -hmm. have an advantage that you know, or a or, or tool mm -hmm. that, uh, that helped distinguish you? I'm a very organized person. So I think my, um, I, I, I'm my biggest critic. Um, and I think me staying on top of myself was the advantage that I had um, over a lot of people in my classroom and in my, you know, in the, in the journalism department. Um, so I would say I, I made sure that, you know, I dealt with sickle cell in college, I mean, in high school, I dealt with it in middle school, elementary school. So I have years of experience. I mean, and what kind of barriers or positive or negative did yeah. you experience in those collegiate years? Yeah, I would say just, you know, making sure that the barriers that I faced would probably be um, making sure that um, you have to, you have to make sure your tests are are um, accommodated. Yeah, accommodated uh, because if you don't, you know, if you if you have an appointment around the time, same time as your test, you have to make sure that your teacher understands. Like, hey, you know, I can't be here today, but can I do a retake? You know, a retest tomorrow, or you know, the next day, or something like that. So I would say those are some of the barriers. Uh, another barrier I would say is is really um, finding people who will advocate for you. Because if you, some teachers and some professors, they just don't understand it. Like, you know, some of the nurses and some of the receptionists at the hospitals, you, you know, get it. they don't get it. They don't know what civil <laughs> is, they've never heard of it. So you probably just said something about it, you know, last week because they're not in tune with, you know, what's going on. And so I would say that would probably be one of the biggest, thing. one of the biggest barriers is getting through to people. Right. So on that, I kind of said, talks about telling of your story. Yeah. How would you suggest or recommend in being authentic about your story? How, how would you carry that message? I would say just meet people where they are. If you know that a person is um, difficult, if, yeah, if you know that they're difficult, you kind of have to say, all right, I'm not going to get through them through this way. Maybe I can try this way. Or if you can, you know, some people, they want to be approached in person. Some people like an email. So you have to figure out where people like to be approached and how they like to be approached. Right. And that's how you can get through them. All right. So using the different communication tools yeah. and making a good judgment yep. of who you're working with. You have to learn how to read people. I would right. say that's one of the biggest things. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Right. And to do it quickly. Yeah. Do it quick. Yeah. Right. And read body language. <laughs> body language. Yes. So that's interesting because a lot of folks choose to hide their disability yeah. and don't share. Yeah. What What's your thoughts about some of that? Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't want to be judged, you know. Right. And I can say I was definitely there at one point in my life until I got empowered to share what my story is and share, you know, how it's impacted me over the years. So I would say that's one of the biggest things that people don't want to be looked at. Looked at as if they need help and they don't want to be overcompensated by simple things that they can achieve. Um, in the workplace, mm -hmm. because all of these students do want to go get that job, get yeah. paid, right? Yeah. How did you approach disclosing your disability mm -hmm. with your employer? Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a simple conversation. Um, I think, like I said, I, I meet people where they are, and I tell them, hey, you know, this is what I have, this is what I need to do, and this is how often I need to do it. You know, can you can you help me, you know, do these things? And 
um, a lot of people understand. Um, and once you kind of let them know, like, this is how serious this can get, you know, this will this will probably affect the, the product that we're trying to put out if I'm not well, you know, and then they, that's when they understand. And so kind of building those advocates. Yes. And supports yes. outside of the family, but then the workforce. Yeah, I'm not that's afraid the of. It. Yeah, being not afraid. Um, with the Americans with Disabilities Act, mm -hmm. we're celebrating. Mm -hmm. It's evolving, right? The right. Way as as our society changes. Right. Um, what kinds of things do you think might be next that might be included in what this anti-discrimination law means in our community? I think it's about just having more people be advocates for us, you know? I think once you can get more people to be advocates, more people can understand uh, what, we're, what we're going through each and every day. And once you have uh, a high number of people understanding, that's when you know, it's, it's affected the, the best way. Right, uh, it's funny you, you say it that way because the other day I was in a conversation mm -hmm. and I was like, you know, don't really do me the favor. Right. Do yourself the favor right. because if you live long enough, you're going to join mm -hmm. yep. the that's community what you said that's people with like. disabilities. <laughs> right, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. Let's wrap up here. A few questions from the audience, okay. maybe. Okay. Right. Can we turn the lights on here and see what we've got? Great conversation. <laughs> we also have t shirts to incentivize people for asking questions, so <laughs> feel free. <laughs> we have extra large and more, right. so <laughs> ask away. Oh, okay. Uh, stay on. Let's take the microphone down there. Oh, I did. I say, like, okay. Hey, Chris. Um, you talked about your support system, of course, with your your wife, right? So, when you're at work, what is your support system? What is that reasonable accommodation that you find at work or in your daily life? So, I would give I give you two examples. So, during COVID, um, we knew that since I have sickle cell, I can't be around people because. I'm, I'm high high risk of, of catching COVID, and so my newsroom understood that. And as a producer, I'm pretty much working on the show the entire day, um, entire night, whenever I'm at work. So they basically built a a small section of uh, like in a a room that they weren't using and gave that to me, and that was kind of like my my safe haven um, while while I was at work. So I would say in that situation, it was the entire newsroom because they came together to think about the idea of like, hey, we want to make sure that he's comfortable while he's at work. You know, restroom is right here. You know, the snack room is right here. You know, you don't have anybody that's bothering you, so you can really focus on this, um, the product, and you know, get it out how you want to get it out. I would say right now, uh, the biggest advocates in the newsroom would be uh, my my co my coworkers and managers. Um, when I had my uh, crisis last year, they were the first ones to say, hey, you know, don't worry about work. You know, we're going to make sure that you're good. We're, we're going to even still make sure that you're, you're paid and receive your full paycheck. Um, and that, it worked out perfect. And when I got home, they sent, you know, flowers, cookies over to the house to make sure that I was, you know, that I was good. So I would say the entire newsroom works together to make sure that, that, that I'm good each and every day. They check in when I have you know, doctor appointments, they say, hey, how's your health going? You know, without making it seem seem weird, you know? So I would say those are my advocates right now. Let's give them uh, our question person a t-shirt, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Another question. Let's, uh, yeah, do we need the microphone or you want to stand? Uh, you, you go. Uh, <laughs> I already have a microphone. All right. <laughs> So I'm going to uh, kind of segue off of that question, and if you're willing to share and or the experience, um, when you started that accommodation process that led to that private kind of safe haven work food, mm -hmm. did you start it with a request to work remote, or was there ever a conversation of remote? 
Yeah. How did you land on the work, the work booth, booth as yeah. being the reasonable accommodation? Can so, you speak to a little bit about reasonable? Yeah, so I was working remote for about a year. Uh, from March, I'll say March of 2020 um, until about February 2021. And so when I came back, you know, COVID still still prominent. Um, they said, hey, you know, instead of you being around us, we're going to make sure that you're in this room, you know, alone. And, you know, sometimes it did. I did want to be in front of, you know, around my coworkers, laugh with them and things like that. But the health is more important. So I would say that's uh, that was kind of the reasonable thing. Uh, I didn't have to ask for it. It was just kind of there when I got back, you know, so they did their their research to say, hey, this is how we need to keep them safe. Good question. Thank you. Uh, we have one over here. Okay. Um, good evening. I'm Michael. Um, with hearing all the things that you have accomplished with your resume, um, have you ever found a time, I know you had to make modifications in the single cell, but have you ever found a time where there was something you considered pursuing or wanted to pursue, but either chose not to or had to give second thoughts about pursuing it because of what that might entail with how you would manage that along with your condition? So that's a great question. Um, just last week we were, and this is very small, but just last week we were in uh, Jamaica uh, on our honeymoon and we went to uh, water rafting and they put the uh, water, it's cold water from the river on your legs and they put the, uh, I forgot what it's called, the limestone on your legs. And so my wife got it and I thought about it for a second. I thought back to when I had the crisis um, in 2019, and I said, I know this is probably going to feel good right now, but later on down the line, I'm going to probably pay for this with this cold water, and we're going to be here for a couple hours. So I would say that's the most recent thing that I had to really think about and say, hey, you know, you can't do this. Okay, we got a t-shirt over here. Let's get a couple more questions. <laughs> We got okay. one in the back with some old friend of ours. <laughs> uh, thank you for your, your presentation. Uh, my question was um, having you know a disability that many would consider an invisible disability, mm -hmm. and one whose um, you know whose effects or experiences they vary quite a bit over time. So right. at very distinct periods, the experience is really severe, and at other points, it doesn't affect you as much. Right. Um, have you ever run into challenges advocating for yourself in which you know people might resist an accommodation for that very reason? Like they yeah. just haven't uh, they haven't seen you experiencing a severe yeah. of your, your condition? Yeah, so um, it's, it's it always happens when we go to the emergency room for some reason. And so you have those people, the nurses who are there and they say, Hey, uh, you don't even look like you're your your I'll tell them my pain and they'll say you don't you don't even look like you're you're sick or you don't even look like you don't feel well. Um and it's like how can you, you know, say I'm I know my body, you know, and I think the tactics that you have to use are kind of I shouldn't have to write a note, you know, to say, hey, this is how I'm feeling. I can't talk. You should be, be able to take my word for it and just say, hey, you know, I, I understand he has sickle cell, you know, Let's make sure that he's seen as quickly as possible. And I only say that because there are some nurses who say, all right, you have sickle cell, let's make sure that you're one of the first people to be seen. And there are other people who say, all right, well, it's gonna be a, a couple of hours or it's gonna be a, a while before you can be seen. So, you know, those are some of the type of the things that we have to run into when we go to the emergency room. Chris, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing all right. So when it comes to the DEI, I think it one of the biggest things I've learned so much uh, over the last couple of years since I published the book and I think one of the biggest things is I never really understood that my condition is is critical you know until probably COVID when they said you know you're at high risk and I've, I've been I've dealt with the disease since I've been younger and it's like you know 
I don't feel like I'm at high risk, but when I look into other people who have sickle cell, other people who have disabilities, and I see what they've been through, you know, I'm blessed to say that I haven't, you know, had that much um, bad experiences with the disease, but, you know, I do understand that, you know, most people are going through worse times than what I've been through, and I, I think that's one of, big, been one of the biggest things that I've learned this entire process. On the follow-up to that, okay. What have you learned from other members of the disability community? I, I think I've learned that everybody, no one can, um, everybody doesn't speak up for themselves the way they probably should or probably want to. I would say that um, just because I think a lot of people, like we said earlier, People don't want to be judged. They don't want to feel like they're inconveniencing anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the biggest things that I learned. I took it upon myself to say, hey, you know, you can speak up for yourself. You do have the confidence. You do have the tools and the resources <laughs> to do so. So anytime that you get a chance to speak up for yourself or speak up for anybody else, you should probably do so. That's, that's a, a powerful point because I remember my freshman year in college, I, I, I didn't want people in my business. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't want to really share. Yeah. But then I wasn't as engaged, and it wasn't until then I learned from what I would call, you know, the upperclassmen. Yeah. yeah. I said, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Right. You need to stand up for yourself. Where well, there are accommodations, there are tools, mm -hmm. there are scholarships. Yes, you can live on campus and off campus. Yeah. And this is how we do it. Yes, sir. Let's get one more question out of the audience. See if we can get one. Elijah. Okay, all right. <laughs> Elijah. All right, no, you don't get a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, um, okay, so my question is, have you sort of been able to find a community of people with sickle cell anemia? And if so, do you feel like the conversation about disability you have is more relatable? with people, other people with sickle cell anemia, or mm -hmm. do you find that like, it's just kind of like a general, people with disabilities kind of like all kind of, they're going through their own little struggle, the community? I think it's twofold. I think, yeah, we have, people who have sickle cell anemia have a different journey, and some of us have the same issues that we ran into, um, specifically with hospitals. Uh, but I also think that, yes, if you're a person that has a disability or a disease, you share the same journey as someone who, who does as well, no matter what that is. You know, no matter how severe it is, you still are, you want to be looked at as normal at the end of the day. So I'll say it's twofold. All right, well, thank you very much. Yes, sir, thank you. All right, well, hang on, we got a few things okay. left. Don't we have a gift or something special for Fred? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you wanna go ahead and reach in there and just see what we've got in there. Okay. Right. Okay, we got yeah. a, <laughs> a signed old school hat. Okay. Don't know if we can see it. Yeah, don't know. So, <laughs> we got a oh, we got a jersey. Game, <laughs> game, <laughs> right. Okay. 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 This is nice. I appreciate <laughs> this. Travis. Uh, right. I was trying to get This is great, man. <laughs> Uh, before we um, re hit our sponsors and mm -hmm. stuff again, don't we have some giveaways or something more like that for the Oh, yeah. Um, where the the, where's the, the magic hat? Magic hat. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> All right. We've got uh, uh, a two-night, three-day hotel getaway. Okay. Right. Right. Uh, Five-star hotel down in the hotel. In Old Town. Right. Oh, yeah. See, that's 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 right. Okay, you get to choose the lucky number. Okay. So if so. you are not present, you do not get to win. And everybody has a ticket, right? Pick me. Right. <laughs> okay. All right, let's see. Give it a little shake of shake. I'm not going to look at it. I don't want anybody to think I'm. Um, <laughs> let's see. I got one. All right. So are we reading the entire number or? Oh, well, maybe the last couple. Okay. Three, six, one, nine. Going once. Oh, my oh, God. God. Oh, shit. Okay. Okay. All right, Aaron. How about that? Right. Um, come on up, Aaron. You got this little gift.
this certificate. Oh my God. Right, right, right. Yeah, and you can reach you, you can take the frat house to the wall. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Oh, well, man. Oh. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. We did everything today. All right. All right, you guys want to wrap it up for us? Oh, well, we got one more t shirt or two. Right? Oh, I'm, I'm going to hand these out later. Oh, got it. I'll get you off in a second. But, so, you have some stuff to put on there? Yeah. Okay. Oh, you want to move? Oh, we're just going to challenge. Yeah, we'll get out of the way. Chris's book. Um, if you're interested, we can get also show the QR later. Um, whatever, let us know. Um, so again, we just want to thank our sponsors for allowing us to open this time. Thank you, Sterling Pharmacy, some of our other sponsors, Tegua, and um, a big old thanks, you know, to Roslyn Hotels for Aaron's gift certificate that he won, and um, Dean Street Pies and our other partners. Um, and then this is our QR code if you want to join the group me and figure out what the awesome things we're doing with the OC. But um, that's all we have for you guys, and thank you so much for joining us, and we should... What time is it? It's about 7 o'clock. So, so, so we sh the pizza should be arriving, like, now or three minutes ago. Um, and, yeah. Thank you, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for joining us. We have pizza, refreshments, there's rice krispie treats, if you want that. Um, we have vegetarian options, we have gluten-free options, so pick your poison. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, guys.